This creates personalization, maybe from a regulation side or personalization from meeting your customer where they're at with unique financial products that has them know that you get them and that they build that relationship with. So I think the next you know decade is going to be super exciting. I think there's going to be this huge leap forward in financial services and the unlock has it's predicated on a modernization of the tech stack. Welcome to FinTech Confidential, bringing you the people, tech, and companies that change how you pay and get paid. Hello and welcome to Accrued, the FinTech Confidential series on LendTech, proudly supported by LoanPro. I'm your host, Ted Huff, here to guide you through this intricate world of FinTech, focusing on the pivotal role of lending. This series is all about unpacking the complexities of FinTech, breaking it down into plain English and providing you with the insights directly from the decision makers and innovators that are shaping this market. Joining me on this journey, Colton Pond is going to be my co-host and he brings a wealth of knowledge and insight from this space. Together, we're gonna be having engaging conversations that matter with people who are at the forefront of this evolving industry. And we're also thrilled today to have Rhett Roberts with us. Rhett is leading the charge at Loan Pro. It is a company that is at the cutting edge of lending technology. And with Loans Pro support. So Colton, congratulations on pulling the short stick or short straw uh, to be here as my co-host. And, and Rhett, thank you, man. Uh, we, we actually had a, a really good conversation a couple of years ago, and I'm excited to take this thing to the next level. But Colton, why don't you give the audience just a quick introduction of who Colton is and, and how we're going to be really taking on this subject uh, in Lintech. Yeah, absolutely, Ted. Thank you. And I, I don't know about drawing the short straw. I've seen you at conferences throughout FinTech for the past six years. Always wanted to engage and really excited for what we're going to be able to do in this series and digging in on insights on Lentech. But uh, Colton Pond, I am the Chief Marketing Officer at Loan Pro. Been in the fintech uh, industry for a long time. Uh, call New York City home base and uh, ultimate fintech nerd and excited to dig in on this series and this episode with Red. Red, thank you so much, Colton. <laughs> Red. A lot has changed since the last time we've talked. I, I'd love for you to just kind of give us a little bit of an update of, of where you're at and where Loan Pro is at before we dive into all the fun stuff around compliance and optimization and modernization and personalization of lending sure. technologies. Awesome. Well, thanks for having me. I uh, appreciate it, Ted. We're, this is a, a great opportunity and uh, a great audience to be engaged with and talk a little bit about how to change the future of finance and uh, to understand the history, but also the steps that are needed to, to change things in the future. So uh, with Colton and, and my team, I run Loan Pro. We're at a platform that manages loans. Uh, view us as a modern lending core, and we provide that platform to customers all over the United States, primarily in the U.S., a couple international as well. And a lot of things are new. We're at the, lots of things have changed in the last, say, six months as far as uh, regulation, uh, things have come out quite a bit. We'll talk a little bit about, I think, but uh, the, the rules and the process, we see the velocity, but also some different markets that are happening with interest rates that have changed. It's a little different than it was a few years back where interest rates were artificially low. So just appreciate this opportunity to jump in and share our experience and how we can help influence to change the, the future of finance. You know, where I wanted to really start, and we kind of talked about this as we were prepping for, for today's episode, I want to go back in time, really look at how did we get to where we're at today? You know, and, and if you really look at lending, it goes all the way back to 1754 BC and Mesopotamia on these little pieces of, of clay that said, I, I am lending this and the person who holds this is expected to receive X back. And, and really it had uh, an interest rate kind of built into it. Help me understand your perspective on on how things have really come in throughout that this whole cycle. I'd love to hear your perspective on that. Yeah, lending is interesting and looking way, way, way back into history. It's it's interesting when we go back to these early civilizations. Much of the records we have from them is from that. It shows the types of things people were borrowing money for, what they were doing. It shows different yields that are happening, and you can. 
you can imply what's happening in their economic environment by the different rates or the discounts. Most of these are traded at a discount rather than a direct like accrual of interest like they do today, uh, more similar to like a bond would be done. But uh, like when I was a kid, um, this maybe date me a little bit. I just loved everything about the history of money. Just super nerdy. Just loved it since I was a little kid. I remember one of the first books that I loved reading uh, and I, I didn't grow up like very affluent. And so this concept of how do you develop the, the financial resources to have what you're looking for and, and then understanding that on, on capitalism things. One of the books I read was uh, Multiple Streams of Income and this concept of having these different pools and how they generate a yield and pay and you know looking at different investments. There was a book about like 16%, which was a, a book about tax lien certificates, which essentially is where a, a county usually uh, in government is borrowing some funds. And because someone's not paying their taxes, you can, you can pay it on their behalf and get a yield. So as I kind of dug into that, I went down this rabbit hole of looking and, and, and reading into the history of money. And there's two books I'd recommend. One probably, you know, it's kind of a classic is The Ascent of Money by Niall Ferguson. If you've read that, it's methodical walk right on through the history of that. Okay. Yeah, for, for that, for that book, if, if you're not a reader, um, there is a, Four hour mini series available that was produced by PBS um, that that actually does a really good job of communicating what's in the larger book. Um, you know, you brought that up earlier in our conversation. So of course, I decide I'm gonna rewatch it at like two and a half times speed yeah. to kind of <laughs> rebring myself back up to everything. And that that that's a that's a big one I thought was really nice. Uh, to get there, but what's the other book? Uh, the other one's actually a little more recent. This this concept of the birth of plenty. This is a a book by William. I think it's Bernstein, and in that they do a really good job of kind of saying what are the bedrock items that are needed in order to have uh, a society that builds an abundance or or plenty. But they they go into the breakdown, and, and as we looked at old, you know, like the the breakdown of lending over time. You know, off the top of my head. It's like property rights, this concept of like a scientific method where um, you need to believe in like un unearthing or discovering through logic and reason to learn things and, and gain knowledge through like a, a, a thoughtful process. I'll call it the scientific method. The third is capital markets. There's a lot built into that. And the fourth is transportation, which is interesting. Now, historically, that was transportation of goods and services, but uh, that also includes transportation of information. And as you can move information back and forth and you have property rights you can trust and this, this methodical process of gaining knowledge, but you need capital markets. So if we go back to the earliest, earliest, as they had success, this begat success. And then that flywheel happens. And I think that's important looking at the history. There's a lot that's baked into capital markets that we probably won't talk about today, but the concept of a store of value, the concept mm -hmm. of currency, this concept that that once you have those pieces, that's where lending comes in. So lending is not like the very first step, right? You need to have a couple other, uh, we'll call them supporting casts inside the, the ecosystem for this economy to work. But lending opens up the access to capital. And access to capital is the core fundamental bedrock of capitalism and how that flywheel. If you're not born into a family that has all of that money, then you are dependent upon those items that are just mentioned in order to proceed. And history shows that. And, and we can talk about the compliance. It has a very interesting history through compliance of how that's come about as well. But the idea of building out through these, these core pieces highlighted in a few of these other books. So you look back to the old history and it's the same story again and again, and it may change who the players are. The, the regulators may be a little different in, in the, the process, but I found the history of money and specifically lending to be highly correlated with the success of the of the society believe it or not throughout time it, borrowing money and paying back interest has been outlawed numerous times by numerous different yep. cultures and you know then we look into how they deemed whether or not somebody was worthy of being lended the money right and it is it has gone from a I believe that he's good for it to all these, I mean, even over time in the fifties and sixties, there was a different way 
that they determined that that viability. Right. Then you know we continue to go through all these different things. Colton, from from your perspective, what what is one or two of the areas that you know looking at the data that has transformed over time? What are the things that kind of stick in your mind that? that maybe aren't important today, or maybe they are still important. Yeah. One of the key things that go back to is if we look at banking in the Western world and the first bank, it was focused on the greater good. Um, actually, the first bank in the Western world was the Knights of Templar in, in the 1100s AD. And to be a part of the bank and employee at the bank, you were a member of the Knights of Templar and you had to take a vow of poverty so you could run finances for the community. And that was, then you had the responsibility and the ability to do that. In the end, what's really important for me is finances are all about how do we help people? And that includes lending and all aspects of, of financial services, but how do we help people to the greater good? And to Rhett's point, society uh, grows as people's finances and, and we are, are all successful together. As you look at the U.S. specific, we're mostly focused on the U.S. Uh, during this series. There are over 10,000 registered financial institutions in the U.S. That doesn't include all of the non-financial institution lenders or credit providers. And, and I can only imagine, you know, that continuing to grow as you get into the personalization that is not just being requested, it's being demanded. And so I, I think that's going to be a place also where you're going to see financial technology companies stepping in and helping support a lot of those things, helping those financial institutions and non-financial institutions really modernize and keep up with the needs and the desires at the same time protecting the right. individual. Um, but, you know, that... that that kind of draws me into the next piece that I really wanted to talk about with you guys is, you know, right. You hit on it just a little bit ago. Compliance used to be really easy um, in mm -hmm. lending. When you go way, way back, it was, I borrowed, I pay back, you know, it, there, there might've been a little bit of uh, physical altercations if you didn't pay it back, but <laughs> we, we've kind of moved on beyond that yep. today. And now it, it's very, very, I guess I would call it orderly. Um, but the compliance really is there in the regulatory landscape. It's designed to really protect the consumer, to make sure that they don't get in the wrong place at the right time. You know, how have you seen, I mean, you, you've, you've been in, in lending for some time. How have you seen lending evolve with these regulations? You, you had me thinking as we were talking a little bit earlier about like the history of it and where it all comes from. Mm -hmm. And it's really important to highlight like some of the structures because, you know, uh, what the, the famous saying of history repeating itself, but rhyming that this idea that you can really pay attention to see what happens, but it's really kind of the same thing over and over again. Like basically history is full of some kind of regulating body that might be a religion. It might be the city state. It might be some kind of government, the structure that comes in and says, Hey, there's some bad actors that have done some things that we think are out of bounds. And so we're going to go ahead and control the, the rules of how to engage. So fast forward to like present day, right? The United States, we've got the, the, the legal structure built on of English law, which has built in property rights and uh, the capital markets and so forth. But the regulation here in the United States is really to super zoom way up. If you were to do a scatter plot, it sort of looks like a barbell. If you have each one of the lending products that are out there. And on one side, you have consumer lending that you talked about that's designed to really kind of protect the consumer. It's based off of who's borrowing the money, why they're borrowing the money, and it also matters who is lending the money, meaning what jurisdiction or where did they have their license to lend that money. And you have to take those three things into consideration. How do you? Mm -hmm. And on the other side, you have corporate lending or like B2B. And the What's interesting, if you go look at the regulatory side of things, um, it's all broken in that, that those two different concepts. It's based off of who's borrowing the money, why they're borrowing the money, and it also matters who is lending the money, meaning what jurisdiction or where did they have their license to lend that money. 
And you have to take those three things into consideration. How do you comply with the regulation? So for this first group of consumer lending, the general premise is that it's like an individual person that maybe isn't a sophisticated um, financial wizard, that they can know how it all works, but instead it's a, it, the structure of the laws are built in such a way that there's standardization, there's disclosures, there's, there's structure to it so that they can like compare an apple to an apple and not have a, a PhD in finance to know what's going on and really understand the ecosystem. They have like increased standardizations, uh, disclosures, guardrails, controls, whatever you might call them, these restrictions that spell it out. And then the second group is corporate lending, which does not have that assumption, right? The assumption is that you can read through those things and it doesn't have to have the, the same kinds of disclosures, doesn't have to have the same structure and format that's happening in those two. And uh, so what we find is really this, this really interesting concept of when you spell those out. Then the third piece was that like, who's lending? And I'll just give a couple of examples, like where you get your license, like matters a lot as a lending side of things. But even if you get a license at the state level, sometimes the federal things will still apply to you. And so you have to build systems and underwriting models and uh, adherence to these regulations that those rules are, are really kind of instituted. And so as you can imagine, if you're a lender and uh, it kind of turns into this geographical landmines of all these rules that you need to comply with, and there's different hierarchy of the rule. Uh, we run a loan servicing platform, our, our, a modern lending core. So our system is like where uh, a tool that a lender will use as their operating system. So let's do like a hypothetical. You're a lender. You give out a loan of a, a consumer lending loan of some kind and your borrower calls in as they would every day. And they say, hey, this life event happened. I'm super far behind on my payments. I know. I'm sorry. Didn't have a job, but I got a job now. It's going to be really hard for me to catch up. Can we kick my delinquency to the back of the loan and I'll keep making my payments? But that way I'm not late every month, but I'm, I'm going to good for it. Right. I guess the question is, can they do it? How does, how does the lender know? Can I do that? Does the law let you do that? Can you do that? Yeah. Was there a fee? How much is the fee? Are they even allowed to do that thing or not? Well, it turns out that uh, it's a nuanced answer and it sort of depends if the lender in that example is a bank. The FFIEC, which is like Federal Financial Institution Examination Council, has an opinion about if you can do that or not. And they've got a published opinion. Um, it's, it's this concept where you have to have standards and standardizations. And so it turns out that it's a fairly complicated way to know if you can go ahead and move the delinquency to the back of the loan. They have to qualify for it and that the government agency has some criteria to qualify. They have to show willingness to pay. Well, they called in and said, can I work it out? So that probably qualifies, right? They, they have to, the account must have already existed for nine months. So if they're calling in at six months, no, you can't. That's not a thing. But if they, uh, they also have to have, they have to make at least three consecutive monthly payments or an amount in a lump sum that adds up to that. So I'm, I'm going to say that um, this does not constitute as financial advice <laughs> or regulatory advice. So I want to make sure that we're covering that. You know, cause, cause it really starts to get me to think about like what you're talking about really from my perspective is why you see specialization within the lending markets. You know, there are. There are folks who are specialized in auto lending, specialized in home loans, right? specialized in recreational vehicles, specialized in open lines of credit through a, a credit card. I mean, I, I, we could probably go for a really long time right. listing out all of them. For those who are wanting to do the more complicated pieces, why has lending technology, and he kind of started to touch on it, but I want to kind of like, uncover this a little bit, but sure. why has lending technology become so critical in navigating all these complicated right. compliance decision trees that all go go right. into this? And 
And why are they so complicated, first off? The challenges of writing these regulations, I think they're well intended, right? The, if you're an investor in that bank, you want to have some standardizations. It just sort of becomes a, a long list of things to comply with. And I think the reason of the success and uh, the creation of operating systems and platforms to support this is because it is complicated. And um, that the platforms really need to provide, imagine being that uh, a call center rep and a customer calls in and tells you a very humanized story, like the example I provided, and says, hey, hey, man, I, I'm going to start making my payments now. Is that cool? Can you kick the delinquency in the back? And you're that poor call center rep, and you're like, I don't, I don't know. know. <laughs> right? So you need to have a software platform that knows, and they can guide that call center rep through that journey to be like, hey, dude, you don't qualify right now because X, Y, Z. And like, you know what? Cool. Let's make a couple payments on time and then we'll be able to do that for you. And so that's, that's the whole point is if you can, if you can make the compliance, um, really the, the difference is the technology in yesteryear was like, do something. And then a compliance team would like, oh, we did something wrong. They would catch it and then go remediate to those things. The much better way is to move into like the compliance and optimization enforcement so that you would intercept a violation of compliance. Don't let it happen. And uh, I always describe, my team hears this a million times, I always describe, make everybody color within the lines. And so more so of a culture of compliance versus a cultural of, culture of remediation is really yes. what you're talking about. And it's a lot less expensive to do it the right way. Culture of remediation, first of all, frustrates your customer. And your customer's like, wait, I thought I could do that. And you're like, oh, sorry, you can't, right? Like Oops. I thought you could too. Gets at the core of like compliance being the purpose and the goal of what you're doing. And as you highlighted there, Ted, like the rules change all the time. So you got to well, I mean, you gotta be ready to something that changes. Well, right now we've got the CFPB coming right. down and trying to figure out like, how do we how do we manage all of these? I won't call them new because they're not really new. Repackaged products right. like mm, yep. buy now pay later or earned wage access, which is you know, is it a loan? Is it not a loan? Right. right. I, like, like how how do you define those things? As of the time of recording this, um, you know, we haven't had any consent orders by the FDIC so far this year. As of right now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but but last year they were crazy and they were all over the place. Right. From that, I think the lending technology really provides the ability to understand right. the right technology. Let me let me be super clear with that because a lot of those consent orders from last year were because right. they didn't use the right technology. They That's were right. using technology, just not the right one. Most likely not in the right way. How are you seeing banks and other lending organizations? convert that focus to compliance challenges that maybe they hadn't seen. A whole bunch of folks obviously have reallocated resources, but that's not adequate enough. Because the problem is if you're just going to reallocate the resources to say, great, put better oversight governance for managing these things, you still have the problem. So you need to go do compliance from the core. Most systems design compliance as like an overlay after they build their stuff. And they usually have a pretty delightful process and then they add compliance and all their delightful process goes away. And so you have to take that compliance from the beginning and in a way that can allow for compliance to these various different regulations that change. Sometimes they actually compete with one another and conflict with one another. Like, for example, in the Bass play, uh, a lot of folks have identified the, the regulators have been abundantly clear that the core problem was to obfuscate the relationship between the bank and the actual borrower or the customer. Obfuscating the relationship, oversight, governance, management of that. People made some other mistakes as well, but uh, that's been one of like the core underlying themes of these different consent orders. That strategy instead is really enable the bank and people like me are selling into those banks to provide the tech stack to enable them to do it. And we're able to bring our expertise of the compliance and the tech stack and the and all the engineering say, hey, this is how you do it. That's kind of what we're seeing in the trend in the ecosystem is a little bit of a pivot of just instead of just push harder on things that were in the past and do more remediation, actually take a step back a little bit and say, ah, was I solving the right problem? 
oh, maybe I need to pivot a little bit. Bass from the charter, which a lot of places have started that. They started with payments, then they moved in deposits, and then they get to lending and they go, whoa, that one's pretty hard. Uh, just send me a report, yeah. right? That's sort of the model that almost all of them have done. Mm-hmm. Our play is to go in and say, hey, the, all that lending stuff, we can be the tech stack to enable it in the same way that you payments. Yeah, I can see how the bringing in that that technology stack really allows the not only the internal compliance and risk officer to feel confident, but also makes that conversation with the regulators a heck of a lot easier when you're able to be proactive and put all right. those things in it. But that also lends, you know, starts to lead into other areas where they can get operationally efficient. Colton, you, you and I had, had a discussion. Uh, we were just at a conference and we were talking about at the event was really a lot around, around becoming more efficient and optimizing a lot of the pieces. Here's a quick message from the Accrued Series sponsor. As default rates continue to rise and margins compress in lending, financial organizations are searching for solutions to combine that operational efficiency with innovation. Look no further as LoanPro allows lenders to enhance their origination, servicing, collections, and payments using the foundation of a modern lending core. Check out LoanPro.io to learn more about how over 600 financial organizations have modernized their tech stack with LoanPro. I'd love to get your take on on what you've seen and you've heard and heck, maybe even put Rhett on the spot with a with a little bit of a challenging question. Yes, absolutely. I, I mean, I, lo- I love those, Colton. Bring always them. challenging <laughs> questions. I, I love it. We do this internally in our executive team meetings and uh, no, ch- no question is off limit. Uh, one of the things we're seeing, Ted, and the whole industry is saying is margins are compressing a lot in financial services. So... What happens when margins compress in financial services? So for banks, for example, margins on average have decreased by 50% over the past year. So you're like, shoot, I have to do more with less. How do I find ways to do more with less? And a lot of it is around automating processes uh, that drive greater efficiency. So you don't need manual effort or people to do those processes. And balancing to the last point on compliance, doing so in a compliant way. Because you can automate a bunch of stuff, but you can do it in a non-compliant way, which will cause more headache in the long term. What, no Excel sheet macros? Okay. <laughs> we see that on a consistent basis, actually. We see that a lot. People pulling things into Excel and doing things and realizing later when the regulator comes, shoot, you made a mistake here because people make mistakes. Rhett, from your perspective, you've been doing this for 20 years and, and in lending for a very long time. How far have we come? Like, and how far has the technology come in driving greater optimization and automation through processes from the early days when you were a lender yourself? Let me answer that uh, in two parts. The, the first part is it, the Medici, right? So we're going way back because we were talking about the history. Oh, you guys yeah. got my brain going, right? One of their competitive advantages as a family was they built the fastest communication network across Europe. They would have somebody in Florence, Rome, London, and they could sh- see the prices of different... Uh, commodities and gold and things, and they could communicate very quickly with that. And the correlation I'm seeing here is building a a system that was a competitive advantage. Their network, the technology stack they're using at that time, it has a close correlation to what's going on today. You see all kinds of systems that if you can try to get an advantage and the operational efficiency, you are going to be compliant up front and you can save the money on the back end and, and allocate that to maybe underwriting better or expanding the scope of, uh, of financial access because you can go a little deeper because you it costs you less to operate things. The reason we started the company is because we were lenders ourselves, and we were just super surprised at like, how is everybody else cool with using this like really old stack? It just doesn't like, first of all, I'm super picky on the numbers have to be right, not close enough. They should be exact. What? And well, it turns out like not everybody does them. They do them within a range. It has modernized significantly. Um, I think real-time data is a reasonable request now when people are still, a lot of people are still trying to get towards that, but having real-time data is super important. So we had, I'm going to kind of jump on a little thing here. I went out to dinner last week with a potential customer and he told me the story and I actually haven't shared with anybody since then, but his story was his wife goes into the breaking store. Breaking news. All the time. Yeah, breaking news. 
So his wife goes into the same like a store for 15 years or something. And she usually spends a fortune when she goes there. It's like 1200 bucks a pop. She went this last time and she's a little frustrated. She's telling him about it. Hey, I've gone to the store again. There's new people there, but they didn't know me at all. They didn't like have any awareness of that. I'm this regular customer here. And so they, we started having a conversation of, they actually have a lot of data about her already, right? And if they would do this like uh, optimization of accessing that data and pulling it up, and when she comes in the store, at least at checkout, at least when she provides some kind of credentials or something, there's some, some cool things you could do upstream from that. But imagine if you could take that concept into financial services, your bank knows a lot more about you than that. So that opens up like operational efficiency and optimization but it also opens up this concept, Ted, you brought up a few times of personalization, really providing them the right products, meeting them where they're at and doing it away. But to have a good personalized product, you have to have a modern stack to make it happen. One of the other things is you look at that same thing. How are they better going to understand what brands they should be bringing in right. or partnering with? Should they be offering a discount to her since she doesn't just spend 1200 she spends 2400 That's right. Right. Those types of things that go in that, that the, the financial technologies have the ability to do, if they just lean into that a little bit. That's right. And the, on top of that, now that allows them to, to drive additional profitability. And I mean, this isn't just to the, to the retail shop you're talking about, but it, it's across, the, across board. the board. Then on top of that, you know, you, you start to look at all of these different infrastructure type things, right? Are they struggling at this because they have the legacy infrastructure you talked about? Are they yeah. using a legacy system? Are they playing horseshoes and hand grenades? My grandfather used to call it. <laughs> it's close yeah. enough. There's a lot of different things that can be done throughout the process. But in order to do that, it's going to require people to to really modernize That's right. the the things that they're using today. That doesn't that doesn't mean going from an Excel spreadsheet to Google Sheets or Google. <laughs> that isn't that isn't modernization. Definitely not. Right. It's always been interesting to me how online banking works. The, there's an interesting book that's called One for Many by D. Hawk, the founder of Visa. And he has a saying in there of design things how they ought to be and then work backwards to reality. Mm -hmm. And if you go look on how a lot of financial services are built, they weren't designed that way. They were sort of this hodgepodge just kind of built over time. So we can be pretty critical of it looking backwards. It just hasn't been, the, the feedback loop hasn't happened fast enough. And it's kind of a big decision to change your financial technology and things. And so it just sort of sets stale for a while. I'm not being critical of the, of the tech stacks that exist out there. Hindsight's 2020, but the flywheel of innovation sort of hit pause for a while. And that was really, I think, the Achilles heel of what's happened and why such a modernization push needs to occur now. If you go to a bank or credit union, even a non-traditional FI, they have the same problem. And so I, I fully agree with you, Ted. The, the cool stuff that's going to come in from fintech and in the areas of technology, they require modernization. So I, I like to say, look at the last, let's say, decade of cool stuff in fintech. And almost all of it's like one or more layers above the core. Mm -hmm. And they all hit a point of diminishing returns. So you got to modernize that back office so that you can get that innovation flywheel happen. Do you think some of the, some of the difficulty of modernization is the fear of changing something and not being able to pass the, the regulator's perspective? For sure. Does it have something to do with, we don't feel it's broken in this little area so we don't want to change it as well. Yes. And, you know, I, I, I'd love to get that perspective. So when the examiner comes in, that's an absolute major force of why um, innovation has been slowed down. Everyone, not just in financial services, everybody's least favorite thing is to go ahead and go through an examination process. There's a lot of dance cards you need to show up a whole mm -hmm. list of certifications and security things and PCI and ISO and SOC and those kinds of things. But in addition to that, you need to have a compelling reason as why to do the modernization. People change when there's pain. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so that pain may be internal or external. We see a lot of that, but I think you are correct that some of the reasons of why that innovation cycle has paused or slowed a little bit in financial services and why there's a lag to catch up 
A lot of it comes from the annual examination cycle and some concern that folks have from there. So strategy that we've done, I think, quite successfully is to really go in. The examiner is not the enemy by no stretch of the imagination. They are providing these really clear safety guardrails. Let's go in and build safe, compliant things with the examiner of, okay, this is going to make the audit easier. We can build out that the examiner is actually, they're the good guy helping out in this process and the bank is the good guy too. What's, what's exciting to me too, Ted, if we think about where we're at today and where financial services executives are, are thinking about, I read a survey that Forbes did at the end of 2023 with 200 financial executives basically saying, what's your biggest challenge? 59% of them indicated the legacy infrastructure is currently their biggest challenge they need to solve. So what's exciting for me is we're now recognizing, hey, to go where we need to go, we need to fix and we need to modernize the infrastructure. The easier that the technology can make it and having a team that can support that transition is not only going to modernize, it's going to optimize and it's going to keep them in the compliant area. And who knows, it may actually bring them into the, the space of being able to personalize it for, for their specific customers. I still remember when when you would talk to a regulator, you talk to a banker. I remember working with a number of startups that every time we said that we were on the cloud or AWS, everybody just was like, they said, no, we don't want to talk to you. It's not safe. It's not secure. It's got to be on-prem. Right. I feel, um, based upon what I've seen, that the tide has almost shifted completely the other direction Right. where the financial institutions and the holders of the sensitive data is probably the easiest way to describe it, right. are looking at how can I offload, how can I outsource the ability to keep that secure? Now, mind you, that doesn't go when, it, when you start to look at the core functionality a lot of cases, but I see that happening a lot. Do you see that being a springboard to the modernization and the personalization? And if so, why? Yeah, I do. So we had the same thing um, in the earlier days of selling this. It seemed like most of the talk track was around convincing people of the cloud. Um, we got really lucky in our timing in the current iteration of Bone Pro. We had, we had another version prior, but the current iteration, we are one of the first 100 companies on AWS. And so our first root ID, our AWS account manager years ago told us, hey, that's one of the first 100 IDs issued and just a super early adopter of that. In those early days, we spent a majority of our talk track, you know, like, what is the cloud? How does it work? Why is it good? And so forth. It's certainly preferred now that it's in the cloud, especially if you're architected for the cloud, not just hosted in the cloud. A lot of people sort of try, try to cheat where they just took an on-prem solution, mm -hmm. wrapped it in a container and deployed it on the cloud and you can remote in there and they're, quote, in the cloud. Well, mm -hmm. Yeah, so you have to be architected for the cloud. It's, those are two very different things. But yes, it does this huge unlock that allows for easy flow of data. It allows for role and goal clarity at a microservice level that you can leverage that and provide a unified customer experience. This creates personalization, maybe from a regulation side or personalization from meeting your customer where they're at with unique financial products that has them know that you get them and that they build that relationship with. The next you know, decade is going to be super exciting. I think there's going to be this huge leap forward in financial services and the unlock has it's predicated on a modernization of the tech stack. And I'm just super jazzed and excited about what this is going to unlock for all of us. Yep. For Colton, how have, you, how have you seen the personalization kicking in? You've not only been in, in the fintech space with Loan Pro, but other companies and seen how a lot of the, the, the technology is, is used for personalization. Kind of give me your perspective of what you've seen throughout your experiences in this space. Yeah, and that's what I was going to mention. For Red Point, I think the modernization provides a springboard into personalization. The amount of data that a financial services provider has on a consumer, that's highly coveted data. But if you look at experiences and best-in-class experiences where consumers are getting their expectations set, it's from brands like Spotify and Netflix and Amazon that are providing very personalized experiences without that data. 
One of my mentors in my career when I, I joined a prior company is Don McDonald, who's been in financial services for 20 plus years. And he sold me on coming to FinTech because he said, we're going to drive personalized insights. We're going to drive personalized decisions. Like you have so much data to be able to use here. And I think the first step is, as Rhett said, having a modernization to have a flow of data that you can access that data. Um, Rhett, I would love to kick it over to you and understand what's next as we do that. And as financial services companies are able to get that flow of data. Probably seven, eight years ago. I was at Costco with my wife. I've told this story a number of times. And the guy in front of us in line, uh, my wife and I have four kids, right? So we did the whole Saturday thing and you go go do the journey through Costco. With all four kids? And I think they actually were with us at that time, right? Oh Everybody wants to go, wait, let's all go to Costco. So, all right, cool. Let's do this thing and uh, go play bumper cars through Costco. And we, the guy in front of us, he bought two items, a giant thing of toilet paper and a 10,000 something dollar diamond drink. And that, that experience sort of like stayed with me for a long time. And the reason I, I kept thinking about it, I finally figured it out, was that the card he used was the wrong financial instrument for the diamond ring. There's all kinds of, but by wrong financial instrument, I mean, there's all kinds of lenders out there who would have provided uh, preferential terms. They would have say 90 days, same as cash or 0% interest for 12 months or whatever. But there's too much friction involved. He's got, you know, me with my kids behind him ready to check out. And he's like, I got to hurry up and do this thing. And so I really thought, well, what if we could build a platform that made finance work the way that I ought to? And as we dug into that process, um, it turns out the, the retail stores are highly coveting their SKU level data on a receipt. But I built out a platform. They'll do it at the transaction level. And if you have the SKU level data, you can do it as well without sending it through the network, that you can charge a unique interest rate or fee structure on a per transaction or SKU level item. And so imagine at a lender who launches, say, a credit card, for example, you can say transactions that look like this, and that can be defined with a rule, mm -hmm. and that might be an MCC code or geography or whatever you want it to be. Transactions that look like this, we can charge a unique interest rate. So as we've engaged with different customers, and, and by the way, that interest rate would be on that individual transaction done in a Card Act compliant way that waterfalls when a payment comes back in, it goes to the right components. You could have a unique, highly yeah. customized program that's maybe based off of new parents or a certain brand or maybe your favorite football team and at, at the stadium, transactions are treated differently. Imagine anything you could do in a rewards program, pull that forward into the financial instrument itself. And that can be especially, especially valuable for folks who are worried about any kind of interchange compression. So that's an example that we call this transaction level credit. Uh, that's live in our platform today. Those kinds of levels of personalization provide a whole new kind of toolkit that uh, I think the future is going to have financial products work that way. It's funny because you said the guy at Costco, $10,000 diamond ring. All that was going through my head is he probably did it on his Costco executive card where he gets 5% back. Right. <laughs> so <laughs> so that was his his desire. And then as you're talking about this, transactional um, factoring. I, I'm probably using the wrong credit. word. Yeah, you got it. Just, yeah, the yeah. transaction level credit. Yeah. It takes me back to, you know, when I was working in the level three stuff for, for purchasing cards and right. the government yeah. side of the house that you weren't allowed to buy certain things on right. the card. And then it makes me start thinking about FSA and HSA cards mm -hmm. where you have to have what they call auto substantiation, which tells you whether or not those items can be charged yeah, on that card. That's right. And I see that level of personalization right now. Amex, if my dollar amount exceeds a certain amount, they ask me, Hey, do you want to pay this, this over time? Yeah. Over time. Right. But I think going to that level of personalization that you talked about at the individual line item detail, if it's provided, Yep. And being able to say, I want to, I want to use X, Y, Z credit facility right. versus putting it on my card. Right. That, that, I think that, that is definitely the next level of, of lending that we're going to be seeing. And, and it turns the card as an access point, keeps you top of wallet and it turns it into reducing the cost of customer acquisition. 
It's a much more delightful experience. It turns into an access point. Then you can then roll it into whatever financial instrument, just like Amex is offering you to pay in for. Well, you could have it be somebody goes to Home Depot and buys something. If it's over a grand, you write a simple rule that says, hey, if you spend over a grand at Home Depot, I don't know, take a picture of your receipt and upload it to my system. I'll OCR through that and say, oh, you bought a lawnmower? You want to do a, a 12-month payment on the lawnmower? And now you have a personalized collateral loan on a lawnmower that's acquired in a very inexpensive way. There's some really cool stuff. Versus the 20, 25, right. 27% right. APR on, on the card. On the card, exactly. And I mean, think if you're a lender and you want to say, I want to put out $30 million in lawnmower loans. That's kind of hard for you to go to acquire that. You got to go build a network. You got to do all this stuff. Well, this is a pretty inexpensive way for you to go do those kinds of lending products. Oh, I think it's hilarious that we went all the way from talking about clay tablets to <laughs> being able to segment out the individual line items in a transaction in real time and be able to provide that as an option as, as we go through all of this, I'm excited really as, as we proceed through this series to, to really have these discussions and understand from the guests where they see things going, how they see things fitting into the marketplace, what they're doing to move this industry forward, especially around credit and lending. Rhett, Colton, is there anything that maybe we didn't quite hit on that you wanted to to cover a little bit more? I'd just like to highlight, underscore, bold. The next decade's going to be awesome. There's some really fun, exciting things that are occurring. This modernization provides just this great opportunity. The finance for my kids is going to be different than it was when I was their age. And it's because of all these cool things people are building. We're just excited to be part of that ecosystem. But I think it's a very bright future ahead. Yeah. I, I, Cole, what are your closing thoughts? I would concur at that conference that you mentioned that we were both at. The consistent theme was, whew, I'm glad 2023 was over. It was a wild year. A lot happened, right? It was very unpredictable. I, I share a similar sentiment as Rhett. Like we look the next 10 years, there's going to be aggressive change within financial services. And I'm really excited to dig in with the, the guests that we have on this show with you on what next looks like and how we can best prepare for next. Every episode, we're going to be diving deep into what that means for each one of these companies. And so I'm really excited to be, to be going through that. And we're going to be able to bring you real things from real companies with real customers and how they're solving these problems. Rhett, Thank you so much, Colton. Thank you so much, man, for sitting here beside me today and, and bringing in some really killer questions. Guys, thanks again and have a great day. Great. Thank you. You too. Thanks, Ted. As we wrap up today's episode, I've got one last thing for you. If you're in the trenches fighting fraud and financial crime, you know it's a complex battlefield. That's where Hawk's AI tools for real-time payment screening, AML, transaction monitoring, and dynamic customer risk rating come into play. These aren't just buzzwords, they're game changers designed to make your compliance more effective and less of a headache. Imagine slashing through false positives with precision and giving your compliance strategy the edge it needs. Head on over to gethawkai.com to sign up for a demo and discover how their platform can revolutionize how you fight fraud and financial crime. This has been a production of DD3 Media with all rights reserved. This is provided for informational purposes only. It is not offered or intended to be used as legal, tax, investment, financial, or other advice. We strive to provide accurate and up-to-date information, but will not be responsible for any missing facts or inaccurate information. You comply and understand that you should use any of this information at your own risk. Cryptocurrencies are highly volatile financial assets, so research and make your own financial decisions.